everybody. We're going to get started. So we have three uh, instructors slides tonight. Um, the first one is Sasha, whom I'm going to introduce because I'm the special topics book, and she's teaching collage and glass. Sasha is an award-winning designer and artist who has worked creatively with glass since 1995. She studied in Russia, Spain, and in the United States. Her work has been exhibited in SOFA and Scope at art fairs and in numerous solo and group shows in the United States and overseas. Primarily known for her signature style, abstract fused panels, she has am amazed a diverse body of work that ranges from stained glass and mixed media to environmental art projects. Aside from her gallery artwork, she has also completed a number of architectural and lighting installations in both stained glass, kiln form glass, and recycled plastic. Please welcome Sasha. Well, thank you for, uh, you know, willing to lo lo look at my work. I've been uh, working on the class for many years, almost like 30 years now. And um, even though I started as a glass artist, I explored many venues on that. And uh, my, oh, my uh, gallery work was all around fused glass, like this piece, which, uh, you know, I borrowed to this watercolor consistency. I also worked a lot in stained glass and, um, uh, made some um, architectural glass lighting installations like this chandelier is seven feet tall made with a, a recycled vodka bottle um, glass I don't drink vodka and tomato uh, sauce jars because they don't have a certain iron content at them, and for that they fire very clear. So that was a com community project of that. But this, what I would, uh, uh, that's what I did for many years. It's like fused glass that took an appearance of sort of water color. So I would start with a piece of um, a pink color. Uh, fusible glass and dilute it to the quality of a water color and extract my imagery from it. And that was fascinating and it, it was shown like wildly and I also did some other applications of it like jewelry. But then I um, explored it like other facets of working with the glass one of uh, which I'm teaching here this week. This is a laminated piece that is composed of fused, painted, slumped, layered uh, glass and looks so, like very airy. That is another one uh, done by the same technique, combining all um, you know aspects of uh, uh, glass techniques, painting and the uh, firing with fruit and cast the glass and um, yeah and uh, then at some point I decided that probably like in the middle of my glass career career of a glass artist I uh, decided that I was curious to explore a material that makes um, that takes such an essential role in our lives today, like uh, discarded plastic. We are surrounded by it. It's constantly passing through our hands. Water bottles we use for 30 minutes will be in the landfill for 500 years. So our grand, grand, grandchildren still have a chance to get in touch with that water bottle that we used on a certain day for lunch. 
so I started to collect all the um, plastic that went through our house and I've been doing it for some time. So here you see some, uh, some uh, wreaths that I made with um, seltzer bottles. And as you can see, I placed them in the forest and they were higher than trees. Then I made some uh, done the lines. I never know it's done the lines or done the lines. Then the lines. So I made this uh, a bunch of uh, <laughs> the lines and I took them to Jersey City to this dilapidated house. And uh, with my son, we did this installation there and uh, made a photo shoot. And then I posted it online and then they were all gone by the next morning. <laughs> so that was a very fun experience. And then, you know, with some people who are present here, we worked on a really extreme project in Peak here that is like several miles away. We uh, built this thing that we called, um, when we were working on it, we called it Fluffy, but then it got its official name Skypod and it was lifted on the, on the roof. And now it is on the roof at peak. And it's basically like, um, it's a sky pod that is using 2,653 bottles uh, to make this seed that is coming through the roof. And basically it's the idea that if we don't address the situation now, it's gonna haunt us many years later. So this guy now is seven years old and it's still there in perfect health through all the storms and snow storms and everything. And they're just living there. And I'm very thankful for the help of all the volunteers who participated because without them, it would not be done. So uh, after that, I moved on the next uh, body of work in which I combined uh, my like everything that I learned and I did as a glass artist, meaning like stained glass, cast the glass, and engraved the glass with plastic. So this piece is made out of two parts, and the top of it is olive oil plastic bottle, and the bottom is a, a glass part, and you sort of cannot uh, tell them apart. And it's important to me because I think that we need to bring this uh, issue of what we are going through as a consumer society, what is passing through our hands to, uh, we need to bring it back to our attention. When we put it into a recycle bin, we feel very virtuous because you know we are doing the right thing. We are not doing the right thing because we are still using it and it's still there, it's still with us and it's deep policing the resources. So in a way I am uh, I relying on this uh, centuries old techniques to bring this junk back to our consciousness. And like in this piece, it's a combination of oranges bottle and uh, painstakingly hand and grave precious German glass that forms a face and they are there and you can't say that this is junk and this is not junk. Yeah, that, uh, that is a close up of the same piece. Yeah, like same here. It's a combination of bottles and it's uh, like all the other very time consuming and expensive and, you know, precious glass techniques that we used for like other museum work. And uh, glass throughout the hand, uh, centuries was considered a very precious sort of um, uh, work. It appeared in churches, in cathedrals, in uh, palaces, stained glass and stuff. And by mixing the two, I'm making them sort of a 
grounded in uh, where and how we live now. Same thing here. You know, it's like fuse cast, and still it has a lot of plastic in it. And to me, like plastic is sort of a material of the time that we are living now, sort of like the stone was related to Stone Age and metal to its own epoch. Like we are living in uh, many aspects of our life in a time of plastic. It's sort of transparent, but it's really not. And you can model it very easily. And it does have a lot of metaphors that I feel are very applicable. Uh, yeah, that is another piece that has both like fused the colors and uh, plastic. And uh, I did uh, make a series of portraits uh, mixing the two. And uh, when they were shown in like different shows, people dived into them because they couldn't tell them apart. And to me, it's very interesting how both materials, like for example, process heat, like glass can take a lot of stress and be fired many times and it's still pliable. But when you apply heat to plastic, it becomes very, uh, very rigid and it just stays there and it's nothing else you can do with it it won't give it won't change it's just there in that stage so in a way it's it uh, provides me with a with a very powerful uh, uh, palette of exploration like in this piece you probably can't tell which is which but uh, that is a part of going through it yeah this piece also it has uh, like uh, certain parts that are made of a, a very expensive and precious mouth blown glass that is hand engraved but it's still held together uh, by recycled materials and it's uh, stable but it's very easy um, to um, fell up it could fall apart very easily uh, and when the pandemic started uh, it was also a very interesting I mean interesting sort of a euphemism but we I rely on them heavily uh, period of our times and uh, because we were not allowed to go shopping uh, we accumulated a lot of shopping bags in the house and it uh, sort of uh, lent itself to another um, uh, body of work. So I started to work with shopping bags and I was knitting them. And they looked very organic when I sliced them and I made uh, like pieces out of them. And um, I started to combine them with a plastic that was melted by heat the gun and they um and it was interesting for me at that point to explore the tension in the material because i'm so used to working with glass and all the qualities the material takes when it's exposed to heat when it's exposed to like um breakage and uh, Plastic is very different at that aspect. It becomes a rigid immediately and it stays there. And uh, combined with like melted shopping bags, it's also uh, like a metaphor for tension that we are going through for the last, I don't know how, four years, five years. It's been like, it feels like forever. So, uh, and also I feel that it that relates to the drawings, like um, the quality of line and the quality of the form is like very expressionistic. So I started to uh, make some sculptures with the uh, 
containers and bottles and everything else that we have at the house. And mind you, we are a family of two and we are very conscious about our consumption. So it's not that we do a lot, but still the pile of it is enormous and it goes through our hands. So I started to make some sculptures in those. And um, that's the, yeah, that is the uh, most recent piece that is pretty huge. And it's going to get um, some kind of a face uh, in between his hands and probably that is going to be done in glass. So thank you so very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Sasha. Alrighty. So next up, we have our ceramic instructor, uh, Taylor, who's going to be introduced by Logan, one of the assistants. Hello. Um, so... Taylor is a ceramic artist from Catawba Island, Ohio. Catawba? Catawba. Catawba. Um, and it's not actually an island. It's a peninsula. So that's tricky. Um, <laughs> she received her MFA from University of Nebraska Lincoln in 2021. So big pandemic vibes. Um, her current focus is on functional and intricately decorated pottery. And this week she's teaching a workshop on pouring vessels. So Taylor. Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Taylor. Uh, just a second, I'm gonna move the Zoom thing out of my way. There we go. Okay, so I'm a full-time studio potter. Uh, and I have messed up the presentation already. <laughs> the um, slide button won't work anymore because I touched Zoom. Oh no. Anyway. Also, hi everyone on Zoom. <laughs> Here, let's get out of it for just a minute and we'll just get back in it. Thank you. All right, okay. Yep, okay, there's me. I'm a full-time studio potter. Um, my partner and I just moved to Akron, Ohio last month. Anyone from Ohio? No? Lucky you, because I'm back. Um, so I am from Catawba Island. It's between Toledo and Cleveland and the coastal wetlands and woods were the environment that I grew up in. Uh, my path through art wasn't a linear one. For a few reasons, I didn't go to college right out of school. I had intended to um, pursue a degree, but I ended up like not really uh, being that into illustration. So then I uh, switched um, to uh, just getting my associate of arts degree and kind of like going out of school and like figuring out what I wanted to do with my life for a couple of years. And eventually I came back to the main campus of Bowling Green State University and I started taking three-dimensional arts classes, which I fell in love with learning how to make objects. I switched my major to metalsmithing. I was convinced I would be a jeweler. I really liked making objects that had a purpose and brought people joy. Uh, but in the end, what I really wanted to do was continue my education in ceramics because there are so many aspects to learn about. Uh, there's hand building, growing, firing, glaze calculation, just to name a few of the aspects of it. Um, but I only took about two years of classes and I didn't feel like at the end of my undergrad experience, my work was as good as I wanted it to be. So I wanted to continue my education. And these are a few of my wood fired pieces from back then. So I enrolled in a post back program at Wichita State University. And I was pursuing wood and soda fired pottery at the time. Uh, while I was there, I got to work side by side with the graduate students. And I got to sit in on their critiques, watching them grow at a very rapid pace in a high pressure environment. 
And I decided that I wanted to develop my portfolio enough to get into a graduate program because I wanted to grow at the rate that they were. So I made a bunch of work hoping that I would get into graduate school. And I ended up at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, I barely got in. And so I ended up getting in on a half ride, but I made a few practical decisions when I first got there. So I had tendonitis in both of my arms from wood firing. <laughs> so I made the switch um, to firing electric. And I also decided I would throw standing up to protect my back in the long run. I was trying to make uh, practical decisions thinking about like a long-term career as a potter. So these are some of my last soda fired pots. And within those like few boundaries I had set for myself, I began exploring and experimenting with decoration techniques and nichrome wire to create lush surfaces in the electric kiln. For those of you who don't do ceramics, um, atmospheric kilns sort of add a layer of depth to the surface of pots. So if you fire wood soda or gas, they sort of finish the pots for you. And without using those kilns, I had to learn how to layer information myself at uh, different steps of the process. So I began thinking about the way that I construct my forms in terms of layers as well. I continued complicating pretty much every step of the process until I arrived at this body of work that was asymmetrical and vibrant. But I love function above all else, and I really wanted people to use my work. So for the most part, I stopped using nichrome wire and I began designing pieces that would attract people at a distance and compel them to come up closer to at least want to see the front, back, and underside of the piece um, and hopefully inspire enough curiosity that they'd wanna pick it up and hold it in their hand. Uh, my approach to surface changed the way I thought about form. So I cut and layered components to create seams, and these were boundaries that my decoration would overcome. I did also continue exploring traditional pottery forms as well, and by making and selling lots of pots is how I paid for my time going through graduate school. My work ended up being interesting for me to craft, but still obviously functional to the viewer. And I'm gonna take you through my process now. Um, the methods that I use to make these pots, I always start with sketches. I'm not very successful when I throw without a reference. So if I don't have a sketch, I have a physical piece in front of me. Uh, my students today saw me doing this. <laughs> and I begin by throwing for the most part. I start a form by throwing and I throw many components at one time and let them stiffen up before I alter them. And this is an example of an altering technique I use called darting. I remove um, three sections of clay from this pot before I press it back together um, so that the shape is no longer um, just purely asymmetrical and eventually it becomes a teapot. And many of my darted pieces have bases that are slabs of clay that are pressed into a mold. So here's a couple examples of different types of molds that I make. Sometimes I use foam, sometimes I make bisque molds out of clay, sometimes I use plaster. And here are some examples of pieces that are constructed with a thrown and darted bottomless cylinder, a slab built foot and slab built spouts. This is what I'm teaching this week. Um, here's some examples of spout templates. Yeah, I cut these out of clay and then I fold them up to create spouts. And sometimes throughout the process, I will take a photo of a piece and I will draw over the image to check proportions before deciding how I'm going to finish it. Um, pretty much every batch of work I make, I go back and I look at it and I redesign it for the next batch of work. And redesigning work is, a, is another very important part of my process. So that sketch that I just showed you over that picture was the starting point for this syrup pour with the saucer. I always explore many iterations when I make batches of work. Some are more successful than others, but that's okay. I think it's important that I keep taking risks so that I don't stagnate and I keep growing as an artist. And then once they're constructed, I decorate them and I keep them damp for a couple of weeks while I do this. 
Um, the first technique I do is I stamp or I incise lines into the surface of the piece, and then I slip trail. Um, for those of you who aren't ceramicists, slip is like a watered down clay, and I pipe it through a very tiny bottle onto the surface. And then after I slow dry that, I smooth it out and I carve it. After the pot is completely dry, I underglaze paint it and I use paper stencils to layer color onto the surfaces of the pots. The paper resists are cut using a laser cutter. I create the silhouettes in Illustrator by tracing photos of pressings or drawings, and I use both the positive and the negative of the stencil. I also add some hand-painted brushwork after all the stencils are removed because I want each piece to feel unique and not machine-made. And this is an example of what it looks like before a plate is fired and after it goes through the bisque and the glaze firing. So taking notes and testing, um, what's been done at every piece, every step of the way is essential to understanding how I can make this body of work. It took years to get to this point and um, I want my students to know that that's like totally normal. Uh, pieces rarely turn out the way that you think that they will. And it just takes you know, a lot of tries to get there. So one of my favorite quotes from when I was learning to craft was the master has failed more times than the student has even tried. And I think that it will be quite a few more years before I can call myself a master, but I have made a lot of pots. And here you can see all the duplicates I made when I was getting ready for my thesis show. And I was hoping to get just like one or two pieces out that would be perfect. So to be a successful potter, you have to be a willing student of failure because trying, failing, and learning from what didn't work has helped me understand how to succeed more than any time I've gotten it right on the first try. The important thing is to figure out what to change and not to repeat mistakes. And I don't dwell on anything that I think uh, can't be saved. I immediately let it go and just keep on making more. So I'm going to show, show a couple of pieces that I made in graduate school and um, just read some of my thoughts about my work to you all. Um, it's, I think that it's human nature for us to want to elevate a mundane object into things that are special. Decoration increases the potential for emotional connection to handmade objects because it indicates that the object has had time put into it to make it unique. However, the catch-22 is that um, decoration can be a signifier for people to not touch something because it implies this preciousness and value. And I attempt to get people to overcome this initial reaction and physically engage with the work because my pots are intended to participate in the solitary rituals and the celebratory events in someone's life. And to encourage interaction, I've developed strategies to get a person's eyes, hands, uh, to move around the form and look inside and go underneath. So every part of my process relies on this layering to create visual and tactile depth to encourage this experience. And I aim for that complexity to inspire curiosity. The compositions on my pieces feature abs abstracted plants in service to creating movement around the piece by weaving painted and slip trailed motifs around the surface. And I try to create a sense of harmony by balancing quieter spaces for contemplation with abundant areas of celebratory color. And finally, I further explore this complexity in glaze. So there's like the sparkle and softness of a buttery glaze contrasting with the movement of a glossy glaze that results in these drips off the surface of undulating forms. And I think that Beauty provides pleasurable emotions, which can overwhelm us, give us pause, and cause us to focus our attention. It gives one's life deeper meaning and compels us to love and cherish that which we find beautiful. So it's necessary, not frivolous, to seek beautiful experiences and surround ourselves with objects that evoke that. So I really appreciate that I got to share that with you all today, and I love being here. Um, if you have any questions, I'm an open book, so please approach me. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Taylor. All right, last but not least, sorry, I lost my mouse. Oh, there it is. Is our blacksmithing instructor right now? And to introduce Emiliano is Sean, the blacksmithing assistant. Hey everyone, I'm Sean, the blacksmith assistant, here to introduce Emiliano Carrillo. He got his start in 2014, so he's been blacksmithing for about eight and a half years uh, at Hampshire College in Western Massachusetts. His first craft school experience was right here in Peters Valley. I believe he took a sword class, right, with Anna back in the day. Um, he focuses mostly on historical works uh, and techniques. He's the owner-operator of uh, Sun and Stars Forge now for about three years, and uh, He's here teaching the Viking Survival Kit class this week with us, and I uh, had a lot of fun forge welding today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the legend himself, Emiliano. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I figured what I would do uh, for you guys is focus in on uh, a kind of aspect of my work that has kind of taken over everything else pretty much from the get-go. Uh, when I started bladesmithing, um, I never really considered about, you know, handles and sheaths and all the other stuff. I just wanted to like forge stuff. Um, I was just inspired by the idea of taking raw material and turning it into something. Um, and to that end, what I realized is uh, the steel that I was buying that was made in some sort of steel mill and rolled out on huge machines. Uh, didn't really have the kind of organic texture. It didn't have the feel that I really wanted to see out of the uh, out of the pieces that I made. Um, so uh, I believe maybe three or four months after I started, I went down to Baltimore to uh, hammer in um, like a gathering of bladesmiths and blacksmiths. And um, I saw somebody making uh, steel. Uh, he had this little furnace and uh, he had two little bellows and I just sat there pumping the bellows for him for like an hour while we remelted a bunch of iron and turned it into steel. And I was just fascinated. I was hooked. I was like, this is going to be a huge rabbit hole and this is going to take forever, but I want to know how this works. Um, and so uh, the first couple photos here are images of pieces that I've made from this material. Um, these pieces are um, mostly culinary pieces um, that are made from uh, this bloomery material, which is basically made from refining iron ore. Um, I go out and sometimes dig in the woods and find rocks that I crush up and smelt in a furnace to make iron and then refine that into steel and then hold that and further refine it and then turn it into an object. Uh, this example is um, a bunch of disparate Japanese techniques that weren't really ever used in these contexts. Um, one of the things that I've enjoyed a lot about the Viking Age work, the medieval work, the Japanese work, like pretty much every aspect of the work that I've taken in is that um, these techniques were used for hundreds of years um, throughout different time uh, and, and places. And a lot of them are really similar to techniques that were used later in other places. And they're just like the contexts are really strict. Like, you know, this, you know, type of decoration was used on Japanese fittings. Uh, to you know, decorate these beautiful little like kind of dots in gold and silver, um, and I thought that it was kind of silly that it was just used on, you know, on sword fittings. So I started using it on kitchen knives. I've made jewelry with this sort of technique. Um, I've taught myself different patinas and finishing techniques uh, from different uh, from different places. Um, this is, uh, you know, iron and silver, bog oak, um, and then my own steel. Uh, folded and turned into something. Um, the traditional like sh uh, shape, it's kind of this like little peaked shape uh, for a right-handed user um, is something that was really common in traditional Japanese knives. Um, and uh, kind of delving deeper and deeper into that, I started getting into the idea of making uh, Japanese swords in a way that was authentic to the way they were made back then. Um, I kind of hated the idea, like we talked about before, of buying a bar of steel and then forging it into something, and then that's it. I didn't have any of the texture and the soul that I wanted to see in these pieces. Um, and so I basically started making all this material in order to try to learn how they were doing it back then. Um, because the bloomery material that they were making in Japan was exactly the same as the stuff they were making in Europe. 
um, back in the Viking Age and then in the medieval period, it's all the same. It's all just iron ore being turned into iron and being worked by people who worked really, really, really hard for a long time to get where they were. Um, and I thought that was fascinating. Just the idea that I could take uh, this weird material and try to make something useful out of it. Um, this is a piece that was made for a trade with a really talented potter um, named Hideaki Miyamura. And I, uh, he wanted a, a kitchen knife. He was a collector of kitchen knives. And so I made a piece uh, for my own homemade material uh, made from black iron sand. I went to the beach with a magnet and picked up sand and turned it into steel. Um, and I'll show you guys how that works. It's ridiculous. Um, but part of part of my study of the of the Japanese style work is I want to do it as close as I can to doing it right uh, without going to Japan and you know spending five, seven years uh, doing an apprenticeship. Um, so I've taught myself as much as I can about the traditional way these things were made, um, about the correct way to sign a piece. This is uh, one side of the tang of that knife that states that it was made for Hideaki. Uh, the other side, says basically I made this. Um, and this particular piece is uh, really kind of uh, a good example of the best steel that I can make at this moment in time. Um, it is really, really dense. Uh, the pattern is really kind of, uh, it's like 144,000 layers or some crazy thing like that. Um, the, the activity that you see in the steel, uh, it has these really dense kind of vibrant crystals that are actually like a transitional zone between the hardened and the soft steel. And when it's polished out properly, you can actually see that. Like you can see it with your plain eye that this material is of really, really high quality. Um, and so this thing was just like, you know, when it came out of the water and I polished it and looked at it, I was just amazed. It was, it was like a really big step in the right direction. <clears throat> um, so basically, um, I mean, this this sort of thing had captivated me from the first moment, and I basically spent all my free time um, and energy and money trying to make more steel and fold it and refine it and fail and fail and fail over and over again. Um, one of the things that Taylor talked about, which I find to be very true, is that uh, it's very difficult as an artist to attach yourself to things and think of them as precious, uh, especially in a field like this where everything is very, very volatile. Um, up until the moment that the piece is finished, everything can go crashing down really, really easily. Um, so this knife for Hideaki, for instance, went through three iterations before I got the right piece. Um, and this is all material that was made from sand, smelted and turned into steel, and eventually folded and refined and refined and forged into a knife. And then when it's plunged into the water, it either fails or it survives. Um, and that's just, that's just the, the way it goes. Um, it starts like this. It's literal sand. Um, you uh, you can it's kind of purplish black sort of sand. Um, this is my uh, shopmate Dakota with a Harbor Freight magnet picking up a whole bunch of it uh, with our friend Matt Barry. Um, we went and got a couple five gallon buckets full of the stuff. Um, it's so so dense. Uh, it basically like every five gallon bucket is about a hundred pounds worth. Um, and then what we do is we get a whole lot of sand, a whole lot of clay, and a little bit of peat moss and water, and we just mix it up and turn it into this kind of clay. Um, and then um, if you're done like we are, you do this uh, sometimes in January. Um, and we basically build, uh, we dig a hole in the ground uh, as like a birthing chamber for this hopeful piece of material. We line it with bricks, and then um, we start building it. We, uh, I designed this furnace to have a pretty large birthing chamber um, and have a you know fairly kind of directed spout so that we'd be able to get as big a lump of iron out of it as, I, as we could get. Um, there's a video that goes along with this, but it's kind of a disaster. So I'll just kind of explain. Um, this furnace was run for uh, about six hours. Um, we used about 170 pounds of charcoal. We used 60 some pounds of ore. Uh, we didn't get through the whole 100 pounds that I wanted to run. Um, and uh, it runs continuously for that six hours. You get it up to heat, um, and then you start timing the drops in the furnace. Um, this is like a living, breathing thing. And with the air coming in, the charcoal settles at like a very specific rate. And you adjust and fine tune the air until the rate is right. Um, and then you start feeding all the sand in. 
um, in our case, we were mixing it with, um, I think it was some sort of like sawdust and some water and it turned into whiskey at some point because it just sat <laughs> um, and it fermented. But uh, the stuff that we actually use, the idea is the sand because of the air blast can go flying out. So what we want to do is bind it together with something. You can use charcoal dust and water to make these like really gross like black mud pies <laughs> that you load into the furnace. Um, and so I generally, uh, we're doing about a kilo of, uh, of ore and a kilo of charcoal every 10 minutes. And that goes for the entire time. Um, once the furnace is properly hot and we've charged about half of what we want to charge, we'll sometimes go ahead and double the amount of ore that's going in to kind of speed the furnace up a little. Um, but after, you know, six hours of this um, and a really bad snowstorm that I thought was going to totally tank us, um, this is what you get. Uh, when it comes out of the furnace, that door you saw, we rip it apart with a pair of tongs and I go digging in there with like these five foot long tongs. So I try to avoid getting burned. Um, but it's like this incredible like column of fire that's coming right at you. And you have to dig this thing out, which is the hottest it'll ever be. It's almost melting. It's just dripping. Um, and we have to refine it and cut it and forge it down and make it into something that's actually usable because this thing is this, it's this big, it's huge and it is hot and there's no way to heat it up again unless you want to build another furnace to reheat it. Uh, so what we do is we forge it down gently um, I kind of uh, lead the, the 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 strikers, which in this case were uh, Matt, who's right next to me, uh, Kate and her husband, who wanted to do a smelt with us. Um, and so they're all swinging sledgehammers, and eventually Matt gets an axe, and we try to cut this thing up while it's still hot enough. Um, and so this really cruddy piece of material uh, that totally wrecked our furnace, <laughs> um, it ends up uh, as like an actual object. It's solid. It went from being sand that would run through your fingers earlier that day to turning into a solid lump of material. Um, without getting too deep into it, uh, yes? What is that temperature? Uh, 3,400 degrees probably around there. Um, it feels like every bit of that when you open it up. Um, the, so actually the temperature is really the, the kind of operative thing. Um, you have iron oxide, which is iron ore. Um, and as it's dropping through this furnace, the charcoal fire is uh, the carbon monoxide that's leaving is stripping away the extra oxides in the iron oxide and it turns it into just straight up iron. Like what you're doing is this weird chemical change where you're reducing this material into iron. Um, and then as it, you know, it, it's a big furnace, it drops maybe around here, it starts to turn into iron. And as it continues dropping, it just sucks in carbon and it becomes steel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 basically like it's about like five feet tall, maybe maybe a little bit taller, and it's like a layer cake. It's like one layer of ore, one layer of charcoal, and it just continues dropping and dropping as it burns. And then it just clumps together. Yeah. It it kind of centers. You can if you put a view hole through there, you can actually see these little dots of ore that are starting to like like vibrate and change, and they turn into iron and they just like lump together. It's incredible. Um, one this one, uh, I don't, uh, that's it. We put, <laughs> we got a 35% yield, which sounds abysmal, but for this process, it's actually really good. Uh, generally, you're looking at like 19, 20% as like a standard for this stuff, um, which is crazy because anything made in the pre industrial era would have been made with this procedure. They would have had to dig ore, they would have had to smelt it, turn it into material, fold it, refine it, try to make something of it. And if you have 100 pounds of, of ore and you end up with 20 pounds of material, by the time you're refining that, you have less than 10 left. So from all of this, like, you know, hundreds of pounds of charcoal, hundreds of pounds of ore, tons of hours of people working and sweating and trying to make this thing work and pumping the bellows, all of a sudden you have like a little lump of material left. But this is how you made anything. If you wanted to make a knife or an axe or a sword or any sort of tool, a cauldron, a chain, this is just like how you had to do it. Um, so part of the work that I do is really exploring the fact that everything we have now is, a, is a, as a direct result of people figuring this out and like trying to advance things and sometimes making knives and stuff and hurting each other with them. But that's, you know, it's a little hard to, to detach from the iron and steel making. Um, if everything goes really well, it turns out to be a pretty solid lump. Um, 
which this one did. Uh, so half of it is uh, roughly forged down into kind of like a starting block. Um, and the other half is just left as is. Um, so we can look back at it later after folding it like 12 times. Um, so drawing it out, cutting it, folding it, forge welding it, drawing it out over and over and over and over and over again, you end up with that. That was made from that piece of material. So this started as sand that would just like run through your fingers and turned into a big, really gross lump of metal. And then through refining and careful work, you can make something that's really beautiful. And that has a lot of aesthetic merits to it outside of just being an edge tool. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it can mean a lot of things. Uh, it can crack in the quench. Um, it can delaminate. Uh, I could be polishing this piece and like in the final polish, I can find like a, a weld flaw where it didn't kind of go perfectly. Just like a tiny gap and that's enough to, it's a failure. Um, so there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of pieces that could have been really, really nice and they just weren't. Um, so that's the, the primary process. That's bloomery material, uh, which is directly from ore. It's a weird alchemic crazy thing, uh, which I've fallen totally in love with. Um, but the easier version of this um, is uh, is called hearth melting. And it is, uh, it's called Oroshigane in the Japanese tradition. And it's literally the same process, but on a smaller scale and using different material. So instead of going from iron ore, which you have to actually reduce into iron before being able to do anything with it, this process starts with iron that's already been turned into iron. So I use electrolytic iron or pure iron mostly because I want stuff that's very pure. Um, I don't want alloying elements or other like inconsistencies that are going to make my work harder. So I want something that is like iron and carbon and that's it. Um, so I generally make these, you know, these pucks and uh, just kind of start forging. Uh, I forge well to handle onto it um, and then take another piece, throw it in the forge, uh, flatten that piece out. Uh, stack them on each other, and then the whole show starts over again. It's all the same, just folding and folding. I switch directions during folding sometimes. Uh, think of it like kind of plywood. Um, all the stringy sort of slaggy grain that you're stretching and stretching as you're kneading it, if you change the direction, you kind of break up the slag, um, and it becomes a little bit stronger as a material. Um, and so jump forward a little bit, and you get something like this, um, a double-edged uh, kind of dagger in this case. Um, and what I've been focusing on the last couple of years specifically with this stuff is a kind of hardening that doesn't use uh, clay. The kind of traditional way of doing it in Japan right now is to take your blade and you carefully apply clay to it in order to influence the way that the hardening line is going to work. Um, I was shown a method of doing this by a Czech bladesmith uh, who has done a lot of work in this field. Um, and he basically showed me that you don't need clay. You need to understand your material, your cross section, your quenchant, in this case, water, um, and your heat. And if you can control all of those things just right, you can make these really active, crazy patterns on the blade uh, without the use of any sort of clay or refractory to influence them. Um, and so this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, hardening without clay is just like, like, that's the real magic to me. Like if I can make that happen and I can make it work and it doesn't crack and it actually works, um, I feel very, very happy. Um, so this this was a, a bar, uh, about five pounds of steel that I folded on itself about 12 or 14 times. And then I forged that out. I made that double-edged dagger. I made this small uh, tanto, kind of single-edged um, uh, dagger sort of uh, knife. And all those kinds of fiery patterns are actually being caused by the vapor jacket. When I quench it into water, it's at about like 1480 degrees, if all things go well. Um, and I, I quench it in the water and I do not move it. And what happens is the boiling of the water, because it, it can't even touch the material, it's so hot. The way that it boils and kind of uh, begins to, to like move around the material creates these really kind of incredible um, uh, patterns that look like boiling fire um, on the blade. And when they're polished out, they they just shine. They are a completely different color than the rest of the steel. Um, there's all these really crazy activities in there that all have their own names. Um, but yeah, this is like 
this is the stuff that I've really, really focused in on the last couple of years. Um, and so from start to finish, um, you can get something that is really pretty unreal. Um, it doesn't look like you, if you showed somebody that lump of metal and handed it to them, that they would never say that something even remotely useful or beautiful could come from it. Um, but in this case, the material was really, really nice. Um, it was very responsive to the hardening um, process. The patterning was really good. Um, this was actually made for uh, a mentor of mine who uh, I met while I was at Hampshire. He was a, a collector of Japanese swords and had been doing it for the last 35 years. And so he had tons of pieces and he would share them with me. He would send me home with a new one every time I went to visit him to study um, because I knew that I wanted to do it right and do it with as much respect as I could. And what that meant was uh, I didn't want to make facsimiles. I wanted to make things that uh, were authentic expressions of craft um, even taking into account that it's from a um, from a tradition that I really don't have any sort of you know heritage or ownership of, um, and so to that end, um, I made him this piece as a thank you, um, and I signed it, you know, made for Ted by me using sand steel, um, and then on the other side, I wrote the date uh, so he wouldn't be able to remember <laughs> or sorry forget, um, and yeah, that's that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody for coming out and joining electronically. That's the conclusion of the slides. Hello and thank you so much for watching this program. Peters Valley would like to thank its sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to Peters Valley's channel to receive more like it in the future.